Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones. Welcome to the lecture entitled Pesticide Laws and Regulations. It's going to come from Chapter 2 uh, entitled Pesticide Laws and Regulations and it is from the North Carolina uh, Pesticide Applicator Certification Corps Manual. So if you'd like, go ahead and pull out your textbook, uh, turn it to Chapter 2. You can follow along with me uh, as we go through the, uh, the slides for, uh, for the chapter. All right, we're first going to talk about the objectives and what we want to do or what we want to cover in this uh, uh, lecture is we're going to follow the state and federal regulations for pesticide use. We're going to understand the FIFRA regulations. We're going to understand storage laws for pesticides. We're going to follow disposal regulations for pesticides. And then we're going to learn how to keep records and know the importance of record keeping. And then last but not least, we will understand uh, the role of the pesticide board. So just reading over our objectives, uh, we're going to see the, the, the importance of documentation, recording, what we're applying to people's properties. And, and I tell people, guys, it doesn't matter if it's a restricted use pesticide or if it's one that you can buy in the big box store. I will document every application um, that I'm applying pesticides in. If it's Roundup, you know, sprayed, um, sprayed three gallons of Roundup in the shrub beds for Mr. and Ms. Smith uh, on today's date. I would always document what I'm doing because you never know when or where you may end up, um, you know, in court or, or defending yourself when it comes to the use of pesticide. So if you've got documentation on everything that you've done, you know, everyone's going to see how good, how good you are when it comes to record keeping so they know that there's not going to be any issues. Document, document, document. And the one good thing that we all have in our pockets right now, whether it comes to social media or documentation, is our cell phones. We have that camera. We have ways of recording information uh, on what we're doing each day. And so let's first talk about FIFRA. Uh, it is the Federal uh, Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. It is administered by the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency. It will regulate the production, transport, sale, use, and disposal of all pesticides. Now, there are going to be some federal penalties uh, when it comes to violations of, uh, of this act. Your civil penalties um, could be up to $5,000 uh, in fines if you're a commercial applicator. Uh, private applicators, you're, you're going to get a warning the first offense that you have, but each additional occurrence after that, after your first, uh, um, after your first offense, you know you could receive up to a thousand dollars in fines. And then usually, though, if it's a minor violation, they may chalk this up to uh, um, to a warning. So, a lot of a lot of um, instances where it can hurt your pocketbook. So we have to follow the laws. And, you know, the law is the label. And that's, that's what I try to help everyone understand. Law is the label. And anytime that you're applying a pesticide inconsistent with its label, you're in violation of the law. Even if it comes, you know, down to, hey, I used five ounces per gallon of this pesticide, whereas the label says you're only supposed to use three ounces. Well, Guys, you're in, you're in violation of the law there. You're applying a pesticide inconsistent with its labeling. So um, make sure you read that label. Uh, later on in the course, we will see examples of labels, and we will go over a label and answer questions from it. But uh, you have to, have to be very, very keen on the, uh, the products that you're applying. And I recommend getting a notebook. Um, I know everybody's on this electronic kick, but... Uh, I like having a three ring binder in my trucks. You know, if my guys are going out spraying uh, pesticides, I'm gonna have uh, copies of the label in, in a three ring binder that's, you know, readily accessible um, for the guys. I'm gonna have, you know, other documentations, uh, documentation, and that's called labeling. The label is what's actually on the product. Labeling is anything that you can get from, from the vendors or the ag extension agents um, information about that product. So I'm going to have all that information readily available for myself and uh, my employees working for me. 
Uh, criminal penalties, again, you know, a willful violation, that means if you did it knowingly or, or meant to do it, um, uh, you know, it, it is a uh, misdemeanor convictions for private applicators, again, uh, $1,000 fine and 30 days imprisonment. If you're a commercial applicator, it can be fines up to $25,000 and up to one year imprisonment. And if you're a manufacturer uh, of these pesticides and you make a big oops, you know, you could have a $50,000 fine and, and also up to one year of prison time. So, guys, you know, when it, when it comes to the pesticides, you have to take this seriously. Um, you know, we see so many people out there applying pesticides without a license. So, you know, the training that you're receiving here uh, is not only protecting the environment, it's protecting you. You know, and you cannot go out and just apply these pesticides uh, uh, without having, you know, uh, consequences for, uh, for, for bad decisions. Um, the FQPA, or the Food uh, Quality Protection Act, it requires that the Environmental Protection Agency review uh, every registered pesticide on a 15-year cycle. Um, your FFDCA, or your Federal Food uh, Drug and Cosmetic Act, it sets the, uh, the pesticide tolerances for food and feed products. And what we mean by uh, the tolerances is, is it's the maximum level of pesticide residues that uh, are allowed on human food or animal feed. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be some residue, but they're setting these tolerances where it's not reaching a maximum level. And this is very important uh, when it comes to, to pre-harvest. You do not want to apply uh, pesticides uh, very close to a harvest date, and that's going to be your uh, your PHI or your pre-harvest interval. Uh, there's going to be a, a cutoff date uh, when it comes to food and feed that you have to stop the pesticide applications uh, in order to uh, to prepare for harvest. And, you know, and if you did it afterwards, you're going to see those residues increase. You're going to you're going to be uh, again in trouble with the government. Uh, these tolerances are set by the Environmental Protection Agency and the violations are monitored by the Food and Drug Administration, or your FDA. Worker Protection um, Standard. This is a standard set up uh, to protect the employees um, that are in an agricultural business that are going to be exposed to pesticides. So large corporate farms, um, even local farms in the area, you know, having, having farm employees, if they're um, applying pesticides for you uh, as the farmer, you are um, uh, responsible for protecting them. And the worker uh, protection standard sets those minimum standards uh, for the employees. It's set up for farms, forests, nurseries, greenhouses, so any type of uh, agricultural commodity that you are producing. It provides safety training to the workers and the handlers of the pesticides. And, um, and just think about that. You have, you have someone who's applying the pesticides. You know, you may have another individual that's uh, mixing the pesticides and actually handling it. Who do you think is more susceptible to um, pesticide exposure? Is it at the application stage or is it at the handling and mixing stage? Um, and, it, and it's going to be at the mixing and handling stage because you're, you're handling a concentrate. You know, you may be handling a two and a half jug, two and a half gallon um, jug of the pesticide, um, you know, emptying it into the sprayer, mixing it, calibrating, doing all that. Uh, and you could have, um, you know, a situation where you may have a, a mishap and, and actually become exposed to the pesticide. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, those are the individuals that, that aren't wearing the proper PPE or, uh, um, you know, the protective clothing that they need to have on when uh, handling or mixing uh, these pesticides. Um, it is going to provide PPE as specified on the pesticide label to every employee. So when you're reading the label and it says that you're to be uh, wearing a respirator, um, eye protection, you know, long sleeve, long pants, rubber boots, then you're going to have to provide that for your employees if they are applying these uh, pesticides. Um, 
You must post written warnings and give oral warnings to the employees regarding the pesticide applications and the restricted entry or areas. So you may have, um, let's say we applied pesticides this morning. You may have, um, you know, several hour wait before employees are allowed back into the greenhouse or allowed uh, back into to the fields where those uh, pesticides were applied. So you have to warn them both written and orally. You must post signs and, and then also tell them. You need to provide uh, supplies for decontamination. You know, if, if, uh, if you know, one of your uh, employees becomes exposed to the pesticide or they have a mishap or a spill, you must have uh, the tools available to, to do the necessary cleanup. And you need to make emergency transportation available in the case of any poisoning from the pesticide or any injuries. And you must also provide the medical facility with the pesticide product information. So. Uh, so the doctors um, will be able to treat properly the, uh, the pesticide exposure. Occupational Safety and Health Act um, is going to affect you if you have 11 or more workers or if you provide it, uh, at least one employee, or migrant employee, uh, housing um, on your farm. This is administered by the North Carolina Department of Labor, uh, and it is also stating that you must keep records for employees um, that uh, die applying the pesticides or if they become sick or if they have any injuries that are related to the, uh, the pesticide applications. Um, trying to think here. I just want to make sure that we are covering everything that we need to cover in these acts. Um, Guys, you are required by law to notify the, uh, the Department of Labor, North Carolina Department of Labor, within eight hours um, of any type of uh, exposure that uh, has a fatal injury on your farm or if the incident causes three or more of your employees to be hospitalized. Uh, if it is after hours, I know, you know, a lot of agriculture businesses or, you know, conduct uh, hours of operation, you know, way past uh, the normal eight to five, um, you must notify the state capitol police of, uh, of the situation. So uh, make, sure, um, make sure you have access to those phone numbers available. Uh, again, your office, your farm office, or your landscape office should have all these numbers uh, very easily uh, ready to, um, to handle any, any exposures like that. Um, your hazard communication standard, again, it's also administered by the North Carolina Department of Labor. It is going to um, require that you list all hazardous uh, chemicals and make available to your employees. So um, they need to know what you have. They need to know what's in your storage facility. Um, they need to have access to the pesticide labels. Uh, you know, MSDS sheets that, that are still on the chemicals. They, you know, all of your employees need to have access to this. Um, your hazardous materials must be labeled. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, you know, in the, in the lecture on pesticide labels. But there's going to be instances where your pesticides, you know, they lose the, uh, the printed material that's on the containers. You know, pulling them out of the, the storage facility, taking them out to the fields, you know, using part of it, bringing it back to the shop. I mean, just wear and tear uh, on those containers. So there is a way to label these containers that have lost their printed on labels. There's going to be certain um, information that you can write on there with a Sharpie on the container. So, uh, uh, but we'll talk more about that in the, in later on in the, um, the labeling uh, lecture. Um, and you must entrain your employees. Um, you know, in, in sitting through a course like this, you know, having your uh, employees, especially if you're on a farm and, and you know, your employees are, are applying these pesticides for you, let them go and get the, uh, the private applicator certification. They're going to be trained uh, properly and they're going to they're going to realize the importance of following the label and 
you know, doing what's right. I mean, following the law when it comes to these, uh, these pesticide labels. A lot of times, you know, people just don't understand the importance or the significance of reading the labels and making sure that you are abiding, um, you know, following the law. So training is, is, is very important. Your Endangered um, Species Act uh, is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, it is illegal to harm, kill, or collect endangered or threatened species, and we all know that. It's kind of common sense. Um, and the EPA must make sure that no registered pesticides uh, will harm these species. So, you know, what if you're in an area, um, you know, that has some endangered species and that pesticide is very detrimental um, to the existence of that species? The EPA is going to, uh, to let us know and they're going to let us know, um, you know, which pesticides we cannot use in those areas. Uh, record keeping, you know, both private and commercial applicators are required to keep records on restricted use pesticides. But just like I said earlier, guys, I'm going to keep uh, records uh, on every pesticide that, that I apply. Uh, and that's why I like, you know, when it comes to running your landscape business, I don't like, if I'm doing resident, let's say residential mowing, and I always kind of refer back to residential, but I know, you know, some of you may have a mixture of both residential and commercial clients. When it comes to residential mowing, like, I, I, and I love the term, you know, monotonous work makes money. Um, your employees that are out mowing every single day, that's all they need to do. They need to mow, they need to edge, you know, trim the sidewalks and blow off the pavement areas, and then they need to go on to the next one. If you're, if you're under contract with someone to actually take care of their pest control, I like having that separate crew. I like having that, that, that individual who is certified or, or licensed or both, you know, uh, actually out applying the, uh, the pesticides. Um, because I truly believe, you know, that, you know, again, it goes back that I tell everyone that, that, that is a student uh, of my monotonous work makes money. It's, it's not only about making money, but this in turn comes to the safety uh, of the pesticides and if you have one person you know one person crew that's out applying your pesticides and you know and if you're larger if you've got to have a couple uh, crews uh, you know one person crews that are applying the pesticides it's a lot easier to maintain that and I understand if you're on a large commercial site you know and you pull in you know smaller crews to take it out you know some of those individuals may uh, apply the pesticides for you but you know again there we're you know we're, we're typically spraying Roundup um, finale, you know, stuff like that that's doing weed control on pavement surfaces. Um, you know, we may spray the turf, you know, one or two times a year. But, again, separate it, have that individually trained, uh, and you're not going to have to worry about, you know, worry about it. And then that one individual, it's a lot easier for them to, to maintain records. You know, I sprayed this today. I applied this pesticide today. I put out, you know, you know, um, I put out 20 bags of fertilizer listed on these properties. Each property, you know, received one bag of fertilizer, 50 pounds, you know. So it's a lot easier for one person to maintain what they've done all day and have those documentation, um, you know, to keep on file. Because, you know, you're, you're supposed to keep these records private for two years, commercial for three years, especially, you know, if it is a restricted use pesticide. But why not do it for, for every pesticide that you do? Um, maintaining your training records, you know, you need to have the employees and employer names. So if me and my crew uh, conduct a training, we would list everybody on there. The company name uh, would be listed. Uh, your EIN or your employee identification number, that's, that's like your tax ID, guys. That's, uh, that's your social security number for your business uh, if it's um, incorporated or an LLC. And even sole proprietors can file for a separate employer identification number. And, um, you know, I'm big about keeping the business separate from personal uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, protecting yourself. And, you know, you'll learn more about that in marketing and management class. But, um, you know, I'm all about the C Corporation, especially when it comes to having license and, and protecting you and protecting your, uh, your personal assets. Uh, you'll need to have the date and location of your training. Uh, usually it's going to be your office or it could be on a job site somewhere. And then the employees need to, to sign their names to verify that they were at the training. And then document the training materials that you used. Uh, you know, a lot of times you could probably have, uh, 
you know, one of the supply houses come out and, and do some training on the pesticides. I mean, they want to, uh, to get their products out there and they want to make a sale. So, they, you know, they may be willing to come out and train your guys on the use of that pesticide. And it's just like when you, when you go to, um, to purchase your pesticides, I always ask them, like, guys, you know, what's the recommended rate on this? I'm still going to read the label and all the labeling that they give me. Uh, but I'm asking the, the salesperson behind the counter, what's the recommended application rate for this pesticide? Uh, I'm mixing it in a, a three-gallon backpack sprayer. Well, they're going to know pretty much right off the top of their head. You know, they are a great resource for you to, um, to learn about these uh, application rates. The North Carolina Pesticide Law of 1971, we talked a little bit about that in the first lecture. Um, it is the Pesticide Law of 71. Uh, it states that all pesticides in North Carolina are um, regulated by itself, the North Carolina Pesticide Law, and the North Carolina Structural Pest Control Act of 1955. Now, all pesticides uh, that we apply as ornamentals and turf are going to be regulated um, by the North Carolina, you know, pesticide law. You know, that's pretty much what it covers. We fall underneath the Structural Act, but uh, all the pesticides that we have, uh, that we use, are going to be regulated by uh, the 71 law. It also regulates uh, pesticide registration here in North Carolina and also the handling, storage, and disposal of all of your, uh, your pesticides. Your North Carolina Pesticide Board uh, was established by, you know, the law of 71. It is a seven-member uh, board. It is appointed by our governor. Um, you know, who is our governor now? Um, you know, we need to know that, guys. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. I want you to look it up. Plus, you know, elections coming up here, um, you know, in a year or so. I don't want this recorded saying the wrong uh, governor. But um, the two people that we need to know in North Carolina is our governor and our commissioner of agriculture. So that is something that I want you to do is I want you to look up who is our governor and who is our commissioner of agriculture. But the pesticide board is regulated by uh, the commissioner and the pesticide board adopts regulations giving more detail more details about acceptable pesticide use and licensing and we're also going to have a PAC or a pesticide advisory committee it is a 20 member board um, or committee that assists the uh, the pesticide board uh, the members are represented by universities state government uh, pesticide industry uh, folks, um, agricultural producers, and the general public. So, you know, there's a 20-person a team that is going to advise uh, the pesticide board. And they make detailed studies and sends recommendations um, to the, uh, the pesticide board. Regulation, uh, registration and regulations. All pesticides uh, must be registered annually. Uh, the pesticide board maintains a list of restricted-use pesticides. And then arsenic uh, trioxide is the only um, state restricted use pesticide that we have right now. This is uh, a poison that's used um, uh, for killing ants. Um, and so, you know, we really only have uh, one statewide uh, restricted use pesticide. Uh, inspections and sampling. Um, Let's say you are going to have a visit from North Carolina Department of Agriculture and they're coming out to do a site visit. And, and guys, don't think that is a bad thing. You know, you can actually um, call um, your local ag agent and, and kind of tell them, hey, you know, I'm having some issues. I just want to make sure I'm in compliance. They'd be more than happy to do that for you. And, and if you're not in compliance, they're not, they're, you're not in trouble. They'd much rather you come uh, to them and ask them for guidance and, and um, um, you know, how to become compliant, they, they'd much rather help you do that. So uh, if they come out and do a site visit that you've invited them to, you're not going to be in trouble. But if they do show up uh, at your property, uh, they're going to look for uh, equipment that you use to apply pesticides. They're going to see where you store them or where you sell them, depending on if you're a, a farm or if you're a supply house. Uh, they're going to look at the land that you've applied the pesticides to. They're going to uh, look at your application records. And then they're also going to look at your storage and disposal uh, areas. And, and so you need to have a, 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 a 
permanent place to store your pesticides. It needs to be ventilated. It needs to be lighted. Um, it needs to be far away from other stuff. It doesn't need to be near your gasoline tanks or anything like that. And then your records need to be maintained in a dry place, you know, such as you're in office. But these inspectors need to have access to all this. And, and the more willing you are to help them, the more willing they are to help you. So it's a, it's a win-win situation, guys. I mean, don't, don't take uh, an inspection as an insult or, you know, you're there to, to get in trouble. They just want to make sure that you're in compliance. And if you're not, you know, they're going to give you time to get it corrected and, and uh, um, make sure you bring, bring your shop up to date. Um, there's two parts um, to pesticide storage, and that is actually uh, starting on um, page 28 in your core manual. Uh, part one is for all pesticides. And it just talks about, you know, don't store your pesticides in empty food or beverage containers. And, and, and trust me, guys, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen um, empty Mountain Dew bottles filled with Roundup uh, in the back of the truck or even worse, stored in the cab of the truck. And, you know, some of these pesticides are the same color. I mean, to be honest with you, if you put Roundup in a Mountain Dew bottle, it could look like Mountain Dew. And if you were to pour some of the darker colored pesticides in a Coke bottle that's clear, it could look like Coke. And people could pick it up and, um, uh, and drink it. So don't store it in any of these empty containers. Avoid contamination of anything that could be ingested. And think about it. We're applying pesticides. And probably one of the worst things to do um, is to use tobacco products when you're applying the pesticides. Or eat lunch. Uh, uh, right after applying pesticides without thoroughly, uh, you know, washing your hands and making sure that uh, you're not getting any of those pesticide residues in or near your mouth. Uh, but make sure you don't contaminate your food. You know, don't store your lunchbox right beside the backpack sprayer uh, in the back of the truck. Um, you need to store your, um, your pesticides in accordance with recommendations that are on the label. Uh, keep away from unauthorized persons. Make sure the, that the storage facility is locked. You don't want your employees that don't know anything about pesticides having access to it. Or worse yet, what about if it's your family? What if you have young children, your pets? You know, you don't want them to, uh, to be near those pesticides. Keep them locked up. Um, store in a dry, ventilated location. You know, I love these little... Um, Storage facilities like you can get at the big box stores, you know, something small. If you're a small landscape company, nothing wrong with having a little shed like that, uh, keeping it locked, keeping it ventilated, having, you know, uh, lighting in it, and, and keeping, it, um, keeping, keeping your pesticides safe. Not only to protect people, but again, guys, protect you, protect your pocketbook. What if someone wants to get access to it? You know, you're the one in trouble. And you're also in financial trouble. You're, you'll be paying the fines and the penalties, but you're wasting pesticides that cost a lot of money. And um, it, it just, it just kind of drives me crazy when, when I see a, a waste like that. I mean, we're, you're not only protecting the environment, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your pocketbook. Uh, keep away from any combustibles. Again, if you're a landscape company or a farm, we've probably got fuel tanks uh, on the property. We need to make sure that um, that you know they're you know on the opposite ends of the farm. Don't don't have them stored uh, near each other. Uh, part two is for restricted use pesticides that um, are in a commercial storage facility. Again, you've got to prevent unwanted um, access, unauthorized access. You need to clean up any spills immediately. You need to prevent um, contact uh, with water with the pesticides. They do not need to, you know, they, those two just don't mix. Um, uh, you know, water is one way to transport the, uh, the pesticides off-site. Uh, do not store within 100 feet of public water systems. So, um, you wouldn't want to have your, your storage facility of, of restricted use pesticides um, uh, near any type of water lines. And you don't want it within 50 feet of a private water supply, such as a well, and, and have um, the chances of, of, of a water source like that being contaminated and being able to 
uh, to get into people's homes. And, you know, they drink the water, they cook with the water, all that pesticides could go straight to it. So 100 feet and 50 feet um, is the minimum distance. You need to have a compliance plan. Uh, it's, it's good to, you know, invite the fire department in, have those guys help you out, talk to it. They need to have a list of all your pesticides that is in the facility as well. Um, you need to notify the uh, Department of Ag again of any emergencies and always maintain that current inventory. And, you know, um, we'll talk more about that in, in future lectures, but, you know, maintain, uh, you know, three copies of it, one at your office, you know, one at your home, and then, you know, you need to give one to the fire department as well. Let them know what you have. Application of pesticides, it, again, it's illegal to apply any pesticide inconsistent with its labeling. Um, always, always follow the labels when it comes um, uh, time for the correct dosage that you're going to be using. Um, you don't want to um, apply the incorrect amount or dosage. That's inconsistent with its labeling. You don't want to use a pesticide on a species or pest that's not specified on the label. Uh, well, I heard that uh, such and such pesticide will, 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 kill this, will kill this bug. If it's not on the label, you cannot use it for, uh, for, that, uh, for that insect. Um, if you're applying it in a method that's not um, you know, stated on the label, or worse yet, if it specifically says don't apply this pesticide in this way and you're out there doing it again you're in trouble and don't mix um, you know don't mix it with a fertilizer if it specifically states not to mix with the fertilizer on on um, on the label if it says you know you cannot mix it with fertilizer and guys to be honest with you again I'm not going to do that anyway uh, we see lawn care operate and I know why they do it I mean they're saving time and time is money um, but I'm also thinking so is product. Um, and that's why I like, when, I, when I'm applying fertilizer, I'm going to apply dry fertilizer applications. The only time um, I'm using liquid uh, applications is, is for pest control, is for weed control, is for insect control. Um, you know, I'm going to apply my fertilizer with a push spreader. And I'm going to go get my backpack sprayer or my truck sprayer, you know, tank sprayer on the truck. To, to do my weed application because one, just think about it. If you're mixing your pesticides with your fertilizer and you have very few weeds and you're applying a, a liquid application of fertilizer and you're trying to get some weeds killed at the same time, but you just have a few weeds here and there and you're applying that weed control entirely over the yard, is that not applying of the pesticide inconsistent with this label? I mean, you're applying it in an area that doesn't need it of the lawn and so that's why I like having the backpacks for that and it's it's different if you're applying a pre-emergent weed control and, you, and you're putting out fertilizer you know that's the the two times that you could do that but um, you know all the other applications no I like having things separate um, if you're hiring an aerial applicator to use a pesticide uh, that is toxic to bees you must notify uh, all the beekeepers uh, within a half mile radius of the application site um, and you need to notify them between one day and 10 days you know you can't uh, you can't call them 12 hours before the application and say you're going to do it you got to give them at least 24 hour notification and no more uh, than 10 day notification um, vertebrate pests you know only these vertebrate pests are subject to control with pesticides that's your black or roof rat, Norway rat, your house mouse, uh, the mole, except the star nosed mole, uh, the grackle, you know, either the boat, uh, boat tailed and common, uh, pigeons, uh, brown headed cowbird and the English sparrow, red wing and common blackbird, and then also your gulls and uh, your starling can, uh, can be controlled with the use of pesticides. Uh, disposal, the North Carolina Pesticide Law and North Carolina Waste Management Act ban pesticide and container dumping. Um, you know, use them up. Don't, don't store them forever. I mean, go ahead and use them. And that's why buy what you need. Uh, and yes, you can, you know, you can pre-buy pre for the year and get discounts with a lot of your supply houses. But, but seriously, don't, don't, over, 
don't overexert yourself and or over extend yourself by buying more than you need. I don't want those pesticides just stored around. You know, buy them for the month. You know, if you know if you're a larger company, maybe just buy the pesticides that you're going to need for the week. Um, you know, leave them at the storage facility. You know, let the let the dealers have them. Um, and you go get what you need. But if you do if you do buy some and you don't use it all up, you know, look at donating it to somebody else. But make sure um, that they have a pesticide license. You cannot you can't donate um, to someone um, if it is a restricted use pesticide. Uh, you know, you can't donate banned pesticides that you, you can't you can't even uh you can't even purchase the ones that have been banned so don't don't try to give those away as well you know call the ncda uh they'll come collect it they'll um you know they'll they'll get rid of it for you and a lot of times you'll see you know like a pesticide container um turn-in day you know they have one here uh in winston i think at the fairgrounds once a year maybe maybe more often i'm not sure but you could take your 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 containers or your unwanted pesticides unused pesticides that's been sitting around and they will properly uh dispose of it for you uh, record keeping you know ncda administers and enforces record keeping provisions uh, private applicators must keep uh, restricted use pesticide records for two years, commercial applicators for three years. But again, you know, they're only talking about restricted use pesticide. Um, guys, you know, keep record of everything that you do. You know, um, it, it's just part of business. And it, it, trust me, it will protect you in the long run. Um, and that will conclude Chapter 2 uh, from the, your North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. Uh, guys, I appreciate it, and I will uh, see you in the next lecture. Thank you.